Because we have hope in Christ, we don't react to sin in sin. Because we have hope in Christ, we live according to the order that God set up before the fall. We serve a God of order. Welcome to the Reach College Podcast with your speaker, Pastor Taylor Gatt. I start tonight talk, talking about something that I'm obviously familiar with, uh, talking about rank in the military. So uh, when, I was in the, when I was in the Army, uh, we learned that rank is important, right? And we had officers of various ranks, and we had NCOs, non-commissioned officers of various ranks, right? And the interesting thing about the way that that system works, you figure out really fast, at face value, it looks like it shouldn't work because the lowest ranking officer that has been in a day technically outranks the highest ranking non-commissioned officer who has been in for maybe 15 or 20 years. And at first it's like, okay, something's broken in the system because this you know, 23-year-old is, is somehow outranks this man who's been fighting wars his whole life. And what you realize is that they take these non-commissioned officers and they and they pair them up with these officers at every level. And what it's supposed to be is that this officer, what, at whatever level of experience they have, they have this partner, their right-hand person, that's always giving them uh, all that experience, all those years, and counseling them on how to do things. And the interesting thing is it doesn't really matter, as a, especially as a brand new lieutenant in the military, it doesn't matter uh, how good you are at your job. If you don't listen to that NCO, you are useless. Uh, you can't do anything because you don't have the experience. You don't have uh, more than half the equation in any decision you're making if you're not listening to him. And so why am I telling you this? Because what I realized over the years is when we look at that relationship in the military, the rank doesn't equate to the value, right? So the higher ranking person is not the more valuable person. As a matter of fact, the, the higher ranking person, if they don't listen to the lower ranking person in those situations, they, they lose a lot of their value. And so we have this thing in our culture where we want everybody to have the same, whether it's responsibility, the same uh, uh, power to do things. And what we often forget is that God structured the world in an order. He made things in an order. You know, one of the things that I always tell people is, First, you have to explain to me how Jesus submitting to the Father made him less valuable than the Father. That's not how it works, right? Just because Jesus did what his Father asked him to do didn't make him lose value, right? And yet, Jesus represented for us how he fit into an order, and he took a place. And in this passage, we're going to look at the order that God has given the world, and Paul's going to take that all the way even into his own life, and he's going to say, look at where I, Paul, fit into the order of the way that God has made the world. And he's going to say, this has nothing to do with your value. This has everything to do with living in accordance with God's prescribed system for how everything's supposed to work. And actually, you're safer there. You're more valuable there. You're more loved there. So there's all these benefits. So God structured the world. In Genesis 1, we're told that God is a God that brought chaos into order, right? He's not a God that just let the world run rampant and kind of just said, you know, it'll, it'll like work itself out. No, he stepped in and he ordered the chaos. And then what happened? Sin broke that order down. It made things get out of place. And immediately in chapter three, God is not just mad and being petty with Adam and Eve. He's actually reordering everything. He actually steps in and he says, okay, we're going to put everything back where it goes, but now you're going to be upset about it. And Paul in this chapter is going to say, hey, if you'll live in accordance with the order that was meant to be before the fall and replaced even after the fall, your life will go differently. 
you will see things in a different way because you're not living according to sin. You're actually living according to the order. So 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy is a leadership manual written to Timothy about how to pastor a church, how to be an elder, right? And he's essentially sending Timothy all the guidelines and rules about how to pastor this church that's having a little bit of disorder. So they've got some false teachings. This church is in Ephesus, and there, there are some, there's some things sneaking into the church, and Timothy's trying to figure out how to really pastor all of these uh, you know, messy people as we are in the church, right? And Paul is writing him to give him assistance. So in chapter 2, Paul tells Timothy, this is how you need to reorder things in the church according to God's original order. So Paul is going to start, by talking about the part that Christians play in the universal order. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made in behalf of all people, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so the first thing he says is he says, I want you to make requests. Now, requests, or some of your versions may say supplications. This is spiritual uh, prayers, uh, I'm sorry, prayers for spiritual need, right? What a supplication is, is it is essentially you acknowledging your insufficiency and dependence on God. It's you saying, Lord, I need you to come through in a spiritual way. And uh, supplication on someone else's behalf is no more than that. He's going to say, you know, you need to offer these prayers up even for your spiritual leaders. Um, who in here is confused when I say our, our, our nationwide leadership has some spiritual deficiencies? We need to pray for them. We need to go before God and say, Lord, I would love it if, you know, 99% of all the politicians got saved in a real way and began to follow you. And so we pray for their spiritual needs, their insufficiency. He then says prayers. This, this word is actually the most generic word for prayer in the New Testament. It really just means to pray. And this, in a sense, if the first one is to, to acknowledge insufficiency, this one is to acknowledge devotion. This one is to say, I, I go before God and I pray because that's how I participate in the world. That's how I change things in the world. That's how I depend on God. I offer up prayers, and I do that constantly. The third term he uses is intercessions. This is essentially to pray for, uh, for this is to have confidence in Christ to save, okay? So intercessions is to go before God and, and pray, not just for our spiritual um, needs, our spiritual growth, but just literally that he would intervene and save us, right? And we know that he has, but we're praying that that would take effect in people's lives, that they would come to know the Lord. And it's the same word that's used of Christ's prayer for believers. So essentially, you're praying to Jesus to continue to intercede on behalf of believers and that there would be more believers, right? And so he gives these three terms, and then he says, and all of these in Thanksgiving, uh, with Thanksgiving being the last one, that term is about the motivation for all of this, right? We do all of these things. We're called to pray in all these ways, but we're called to pray in all these ways because we understand who we're praying to is our Savior. We have a gratitude and a motivation to, uh, to pray to God. Um, he, he then says, for all men, but that's not really the thrust. He says, do th pray this for everyone. But then he says, for kings, for those in high authority. Now, why, why is it that he then moves into that? And he says why directly. He says the reason that you should pray for these kings and these, these people in high places is so that you can live tranquil and quiet lives, so that you can basically live in peace and quiet. Now, this is where we, we like to stop here. Like That's like the goal. The goal is, well, if I could just... Just live a life of peace and quiet, right? That's all I want. I want to be left alone. Pray, pray that the government gets off my back. But he doesn't actually stop there. He says, pray for these men so that you can live a life of peace and quiet 
so that more people can come to know the Lord. See, we know that in persecution, the church spreads, but that is actually because God is undermining the attacks of the enemy. He's using the enemy's persecution of the church and the blood of the martyrs to affect those watching. But this is God's preferred method, the way the gospel would spread. That you, living in a, a peaceful, quiet way, you living in dignity, could go to your next door neighbor and share the gospel with them. And you can, because here's the deal, no matter how much peace and tranquility that you live with as a believer, no one, in the, no one that's lost has that. Their lives are turmoil, they're clawing for the next thing, they're trying to overcome, or they're just, they've given up, and they're living in total depression and anxiety because life never works out. But when you live a life of peace and quiet, and you have confidence in the Lord, you can go to them and you can say, hey, do you want what I have? Do you want this? Do you want to know Jesus? And here's the thing. When persecution comes, when the church is hunted down, it's all of your neighbors that go, that guy that was the most peaceful and quiet person I've ever met. He was always content. Why is he getting in trouble? Why is he getting arrested? Why is he getting put in jail? I don't understand everything about him. Every time I was near him, he just seemed calm. She just seemed at peace. See, we're called to live with that eternal perspective, that peace and quiet, because it registers with, our, with, with those around us. They see Christ in us, and then either they catch it because they, just because we're sharing it with them, or when we finally do get persecuted because the peace and quiet is up, it doesn't connect. It doesn't make sense to them. They think something's off here, and then that makes them investigate. But either way, the goal of praying for this peace and quiet is so the gospel will spread. He says this is the goal that we're trying to meet. In verses 3 and 4, he says it pleases God because it allows you to spread the gospel. When you live a godly and dignified life, that is the testimony. Now, you've heard... You've heard this phrase, and I, I want to tell you that this phrase is, firstly, it's, it's misappropriated. I can't remember who people usually quote it to, but it's not, it's not as popular a person as you'd think. The, the phrase, um, share the gospel, and if necessary, use words, that is a terrible phrase, okay? Here's the deal. You, your, the sentiment behind it is okay. The idea is that you should live a life where the gospel is being expressed by your actions. Please do that. But if you don't use your words, you have not shared the gospel. You have stopped short. Right, because what's going to happen is your neighbor's going to get to heaven, see you on the other side of the line, and go, "Why didn't you tell me?" And you go, "Well, I always lived like a generally good life." Great, but you have to actually tell them about Jesus. Now, the reason you need to live a life that doesn't contradict that is because when you go to tell them about Jesus, and they go, oh, "Are you kidding? Like you're you're not you're not the person I want to take spiritual advice from." That's a really bad thing, right? So we have to live in accordance with that, but then we have to actually go say something to them. And we do it because Christ is our Savior. We have gratitude. We see that God has saved us, and we want others to have that and experience that, right? How do you love God? You love what he loves. How do you love people? You show them God. So the way you love God is you bring people to him. Right, That is how you show your Savior that you have gratitude. You point people to him. Look at verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator, also between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed as a preacher and an apostle. I am telling you the truth. I am not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith, and truth. Verses 1 through 4, he says, pray for the order of the world. Pray that things work out so that you can live this peaceful and tranquil life so that you can share the gospel. And then 5 through 7, he begins to shift to a description of the order that's even further above them, right? He starts with the order you can see, your kings, your rulers. But then he says, you know, that's not even, that's not, that's only part of the picture. He actually shifts above that. And he says, Pray to God, the one God, the guy at the top of all this, and then pray because there's a mediator, the one man, Jesus Christ, who is filling that role as a ransom. Now, here's an interesting thing. Today, uh, if you listen, if you were in uh, 
service today, uh, Pastor Michael talked about the ransom that is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that that word in uh, in First Peter is actually a verb, and it's describing what was done with the blood. It was paid as a ransom, right? It was we were ransomed by that blood. But in this passage, we're actually given the same root word ransom, but it's a noun because it's describing Jesus Himself. He is the ransom. Jesus didn't just pay the ransom; He was the ransom. It is that that made him the mediator, that made him the, the, the go-between, the Christ, the Messiah. And it is that man that we have gratitude towards, right? And think about the way that covers everything. He says, the man, Christ Jesus, right? The whole thing is to fight. You know, you got people in the first century that were like, well, Jesus was a really good man. Well, no, no, he was also Christ. He was 100% God. And then you had people that were saying, well, you know, Jesus was divine. He was God, but he wasn't one of us because men are, you know, just bad. And that's all we've got. And, and no, no, he was the man, 100 percent man. See, it's that man that is our Messiah, our Savior. He is the go between. And he is that ransom. Now, I want you to understand this word ransom, because a lot of times we we see this as a, a payment. Have you ever heard somebody say, you know, God bought us back from Satan. No, the ransom wasn't paid to Satan, okay? Satan didn't have ownership of us, right? We were ransomed from God's wrath into God's mercy, right? The person we owe for our sin is God. And the only person who could pay that ransom was God. That's why Jesus had to come and be a man, the only people that owed God, and pay the ransom with the power that only God had to pay it, right? And so he steps in, he ransoms us, and this is the gospel. This gospel reorders us to God. See, we are in a rebellious relationship. We are out of order with God, and that ransom, it begins to make us right again. It puts us in order with God. He says, this gospel came at just the right time. It came exactly when God intended it to, and it set things straight. And then in verse 7, he says, now I am ordered under it. I, Paul, I'm ordered under it. Uh, uh, look at verse 7 again. He says, for this I was appointed as a preacher and an apostle. I am telling you the truth. I am not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. He says, I was appointed. He was placed in a position. He didn't say, You know, here I am doing my thing. He says, no, no, no. God put me in a place and in a time to do a job that he's given to me. Why does he say that? He's gone. He started with the order you can see. He said there's there's rulers, there's these authorities. Then he says, and they're not even really the point. There's this God, the one God and the mediator. That's the real order. And because of the order that they have established that I pray for and the kings and the rulers so that I can spread the gospel, I've been placed in that order. I'm a part of it. I am an apostle. I am a teacher. The the actual description he gives here is of somebody who is a a, a herald, a preacher, someone who is who's been appointed to proclaim the truth. That person has authority, but that authority is because God put them in that place. He says, "I was appointed to the Gentiles." Um, if you think about Paul where he comes from, Saul, right? A zealous Jewish man who hated the faith. Uh, Every time he brings up that he was appointed as the apostle to the Gentiles, he almost has to laugh at himself, right? Because he's like, old me, Saul, would have been disgusted that my job is to make sure that Gentiles come to know the Lord, right? He couldn't have imagined that in his previous life. And it's the irony of his entire existence that he was called by Jesus Christ specifically not to the Jewish people. He was sent to the Gentiles. He says, that's my spot. That's where I've been ordered. Again, talk about, talk about thinking that you don't have value. Saul did not think. Saul of Tarsus didn't think Gentiles had any value. He didn't think they mattered at all. And yet this man writing this letter He has gone all over the known world trying to proclaim the truth of the gospel 
to the Gentiles in faith and in truth. What is being in faith and in truth? It's the same thing as being in Christ. It's the only place to be. And really, that's really what this whole portion is getting at. It's saying if you want to be in the order that God has set up for the world, you have to be in Christ. You have to be in truth. You have to be in faith. It says pray for the order. See the whole order and find your place in it. That's our place in the universe. But what about our place in the body, in the local church? What about, what about the church's place? Right, And so he, he moves from this universal order that he's describing into this particular order. And he begins to say, okay, but how should you act in your church where you are? Look at verse 8. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and dispute. Okay, so he moves from verse 8. He says, uh, I want you to see that he restarts at prayer, right? That was the start of what we're supposed to do in the universal order. We're supposed to pray for it. And then he's resetting now, but he starts again at prayer. And he says, men, everywhere you are, you should be praying. This is how you participate. This is what you contribute. It's prayer. And he says, with hands lifted. Now, I want you to see, this is where the trouble starts in this passage. We're going to move through this passage. And what you're going to see is that there's a difference in the Bible between things that are prescriptive and things that are descriptive. Okay, and navigating those is where the trick is, because when Paul says, I want you to pray with lift with hands lifted high, does he mean that the only way to pray is with your hands up? That's it. We're all sinning now that we don't pray like that. Right. No, of course, that's not what we mean. It's a description. It's a description of how they commonly prayed in their time. Right now, what what could be applied from that? They they prayed like that because it was saying, God, have me. I'm yours. I have clean hands and a pure heart. Take me, right? There, there's a lot of the attitude that that posture distributes. Now, I, I'll tell you this. Posture affects your heart. Maybe you need to be on your knees because you need to remind yourself that you're bowing before your king. Maybe you need to have your hands raised because you need to remind yourself that you're receiving him and and you want all of him and you have clean hands to offer him only clean because he made him clean. Right. And and sometimes your posture affects how you are thinking through your prayers, what you're presenting to God. But this this uh, description is talking about an attitude. And the thrust of this passage is actually about the last part, the not doing it in anger and quarreling. He's talking to men. What is the opposite of order and peace and quiet? Bickering. Now, I, I can only imagine that some of you grew up in churches with deacon boards. There was a lot of bickering and, and sometimes a lot of quarreling. Now, we have deacons in Evergreen, if you didn't know that. They're called life group shepherds, and they do what deacons are supposed to do, which is that they minister to the body. But a lot of our churches are distracting from the gospel because they're busy battling it out in church politics. They're missing the point. And he says, don't do that. Don't go into the church and distract from the gospel because you're fighting with each other. That's not how you create order. That's not how you fit in. Instead, pray with hands lifted high. He's telling them about the right attitude to have here. Now, I'll stop here. Paul it gives this principle in 1 Corinthians that I I love. There's this entire portion. He first he uses meat sacrifice to idols, then he uses tongues, and and in 1 Corinthians the vehicle he's using these two things as a vehicle for this principle. The question at hand is this: When is something sin, and when is it not sin? And essentially, Paul is trying to demonstrate to the church in Corinth. He says, Hey, is what you're doing distracting from the gospel? Then it's sin. Is what you're doing not distracting from the gospel? Then it's not sin, right? This is how I, I talk to young adults. They always say, well, how do we know what laws in the Old Testament to keep? Well, let me ask you this. Is murder ever not distracting from the gospel? No, it is always distracting from the gospel. Don't do it. If you eat bacon, is that distracting from the gospel in our culture? Probably not. That's why it's not something that we hold to because it doesn't get in the way of us loving on the people around us and sharing God, okay? That's the 
the way that Paul delineates that gray area of like, what am I supposed to be doing? What am I not supposed to be doing? He even ends that by saying, listen, if it's distracted from the gospel, I'll never eat meat again. Right? Because he's saying the point is don't get in the way of the gospel. That same principle is going to be true in this passage. Everything he says to men and to women, he's saying, look, don't distract from the people who come into your church hearing the gospel and focusing on the right thing. And that is that is how we navigate this text to understand what he's describing and what he's actually prescribing. So look, look at verse 9. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or expensive apparel, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Okay, so again, a lot of this is going to be a, de a description. There's a little bit of context we need here. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world is in the city of Ephesus. It is the Temple of Artemis. And if you don't know anything about the Temple of Artemis, it was basically a sex cult. And so when you went to the Temple of Artemis, you saw women in ornate clothing, dressed up, getting attention because they were there for a specific reason and purpose. Now, what he begins to describe here is women who are doing everything they can to get a certain kind of attention even when we're there at church. That is what he's saying. None of this is meant to be taken by us and be like, okay, don't braid your hair. Got it. Uh, don't wear gold or pearls. Got it. That's not the point. He's saying don't go to church and try to get all the attention. That's not what church is for. You're not there to get the men in the church to pay attention to you. And I don't want that somebody walks into the church, sees you, and says, did we go to church or the Temple of Artemis today? It shouldn't look the same. They should be very different places. And that is what Paul begins to describe. In verse 11, there are actually, uh, or sorry, back up to verse 10, he says, instead, you should clothe yourself, yourself in good works and godliness. You should be serving you should be loving on others not distracted from the gospel then in verse 11 he gives four things that i want to note here okay so the there are other passages that talk about a women uh, talk about women being um quiet or silent in church now if you look at the other passages a lot of times the context of those passages is actually a marriage context and uh that doesn't seem to be the case here there's a little bit of an implication of that uh, in this passage, but that's not actually the angle that Paul's going at right now in First Timothy. So the, the, we can't just compare them one for one and say, well, he talks about women being silent over here in Corinthians, and he talks about them being silent in Timothy, and it's, he's making the same point. He's not, okay? Because remember, what's he solving in First Corinthians? He's solving just like this, this mega church that's like lost its mind. It just has all these massive issues. And part of what he's saying there is, hey, ladies, you need to you need to be in a, a relationship with your husband that's appropriate at church, right? And then he comes over here to Timothy, he has a different problem. He's talking about leadership. He's talking about how to pastor a church. So this has a different thrust. If we look at the second thing I want you to see is the word quietly doesn't even really mean silence. Um, a lot of times this is the kind of verse that, that like the world throws rocks at us because they're like, you just want women to shut up and just not say anything. Okay. Here's the deal. That verse, this verse, it's most likely talking about being teachable. How do we know that? Because there's a bunch of other places where Paul holds up women who are teaching, prophesying, praying in front of people. Like he clearly the women were not supposed to just go into church and just keep their mouth shut. Just don't say anything. Don't contribute. That's not the goal. He's talking about having a spirit of teachableness, primarily probably from the teacher. Right? He's saying, go in and learn from the guy who's pastoring the church, which leads me into the third thing. The third thing is he's probably actually solving a problem about gossip. He's probably saying, hey, you should be going into church with a teachable heart and teachable spirit to hear from the pastor, not talk about the latest gossip. 
not spread the latest story. But here's actually the biggest takeaway from verse 11. In Judaism, women were supposed to be silent in the temple. And in Judaism, it's not clear that it mattered at all if women actually grew and learned spiritually. The fact that Paul says you should go in and you should take this quiet attitude to receive instruction would have been mind-blowing. It would have been provocative, even progressive. Paul looks like a liberal here because what he just said is it's important that you women go to church and you learn and you grow. It matters. See, the, ch the church has had rocks thrown at its head for several hundred years now because we're holding women down. And, and, and what, what, what does our culture say freedom is for women? The sexual revolution or even better now, becoming a man? That's not freedom. What he says is now, finally, women have freedom to go into the church and actually grow and learn and, and be more Christ-like. Why? Because in a whole bunch of other places, Paul says, because you're going to participate in the ministry. You've got stuff to do here. We need you to share the gospel, to build up the, the, the body and the ministry. So he says, go in and learn. See, we're supposed to find this order in the church because it showcases the gospel. This is the point. There's an order in the world around us, and there's an order in the church. Paul is going to end this by moving into uh, the last couple of verses here. He's going to say, look, protect these things. Fight against disorder. And he's going to begin to lay out some things that you shouldn't do. Look at verse 12. But I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a wrongdoer. Okay, this is like three of the most hotly debated verses in the entire Bible, right? And, and again, we get rocks thrown in our heads because it, if you just read it flat out, it's like, Paul really hates women. That's... That's rough, right? Okay, but we need to examine this. We need to see what's actually happening. First of all, context. What is the book about? The book is about leadership and pastoring a church. When he says, I don't want women to teach or exercise authority, in the very next chapter, he's going to outline the descriptions of qualifications for elders and for deacons. And you know what the main difference between an elder and a deacon is? Teaching and having authority. Those are the two big things that an elder does. Now, keep in mind, what we're, the Southern Baptist Convention, I don't know if you know this, is in a hot mess over the idea of women pastors. Okay, I'm going to help you out with this. There's no such thing as a church staff in the first century church. Okay, now, what Paul is saying here is he's saying, Women do not get to be in the office of elder, overseer, pastor, the top guy. In his mind, he is not restricting women from working at the church. He's not restricting them from teaching a Sunday school lesson. He's not, he's not restricting them from being a, a pastor over a ministry lane. Because why? Because again, church staffs didn't exist. You know, the way we treat this at Evergreen, I'm not... A, a pastor in the fullest sense of that word. I'm not an elder. I have been given uh, elder authority by an elder. I'm in training to someday maybe be an elder. That's what our women pastors are. They are essentially uh, delegated authority from their elders, but they are not elders. They are not going to be the senior pastor. And, and what's the problem with this? He's not saying uh, women are not capable of that job. They couldn't handle it. It's no. He's saying that's not the role that God has put them in. They shouldn't be an elder. They shouldn't be the teacher exercising authority over the church because it's not the place God has created for them to do that. Okay? There's a whole bunch. There's just this waterfall of issues that would occur from that. Okay? Imagine uh, imagine a church with a female pastor. And, and again, keep in mind, first century, right? First century. So now we've got female pastor telling men in the church what to do. 
how are they going to go home and handle their wives who are who, who are going to be like, I don't have to listen to you anymore. We got a female pastor. Like women are in charge around here, right? There's a there's this watershed of issues that are going to occur. And Paul is saying the role of a woman is not to be the elder, not to be the teacher and the authority. What he is not saying is women need to go into church. They need to not braid their hair, shut up, and never teach a class. That's not what's happening here. And that's how we've read it for like, I don't know, a couple hundred years at least. And and there's a lot in there that we're we're almost oversimplifying. Remember, one of the best phrases that it comes around ever in all time. Scripture doesn't mean what it says. It means what it means. We have to study it and understand the parameters of how it was written and why Paul is saying what he's saying. You know, one of the ways I ask people when I when I say, okay, women can't teach. Okay, that's what you're saying to me because of this passage. So what about like share a testimony? What about give a devotional? What about read a passage, passage out of their journal? Where's the line? That's not, you can't even mitigate that. It doesn't make sense. But if I'm saying women can't be the elder, the overseer, the pastor of the church, all of a sudden the line is very clear. It's very easy to mitigate, right? It's not, um, it's not this weird, great area. I have literally seen churches where they said, uh, no, we don't let women teach here, but they can get up and share. What? What exactly is the difference? Like, I don't understand. Is she going to read scripture and explain it? Like, oh, sounds like teaching. Like, that sounds like a problem, you know? And so you can't, you can't do that, okay? Now, the obvious question is why? Paul, why are you making it like this? And this is where we get into verse 13. He begins to describe in verse 13 the natural order pre-fall. Now, keep in mind, it's not about value. Look at 13 again. For it was Adam who's created and then Eve. So that description is not about value. He didn't just say, clearly, Adam was more important. He said Adam was created first. He was given a certain amount of authority, and then Eve was created. What did God do when he saw Adam alone? For the first time, he said, this isn't good. There was something missing. Adam lost value without Eve. It was important for her to be there. So it's not about him having more value, he was put in a position and then Eve was brought in and put in a position. In verse 14, we see that Eve stepped outside of the safety and order of everything that God had created and then it broke. Now, keep in mind, this is not Paul blaming Eve. He says she was deceived. She was led astray, but she stepped out of that order and everything fell apart. You ever played that kids game Jenga? the tower of little wooden blocks and you try to pull them out and eventually you pull out one and can't stand up anymore. Eve was that block and she was in her perfect spot, valued by God, valued by Adam. She had her place and when the devil tricked her and she moved out of that place, everything came crashing down. It was breaking that order that, that made everything so bad. I want you to see, this isn't even where it ends. It gets even crazier. Look at verse 15. But women will be preserved through childbirth if they continue in faith, love, and sanctity with moderation. Okay, you have no idea how many young adults bring that verse to me, and they're like, what is happening, right? And I always like to throw them off right at the beginning and be like, well, apparently for women, you can believe in Jesus or have a kid. <laughs> what? <laughs> right? No, that's not what he's saying, right? Why does he say that they can that they can uh, be that they can be saved through childbearing? In verse thirteen, we're introduced to Genesis chapter two, the creation of Adam and Eve, right? A detailed account. In verse fourteen, we're introduced to Genesis chapter three, the fall, and in verse fifteen, Paul uses um, a, a word. Um, it, it's a, a syndoki. Okay, now that word basically means it's the part representing the whole. Okay, so when he says she'll be saved through childbearing, the reference is to the whole curse. It's to the entire portion of chapter three. It's, it's like verse eight through, I think, 24, where, where God is reordering the world after the fall and he is describing what now is going to be the case. Think about it like this. Eve stepped out of safety, and what happened? 
Women will no longer want to submit in the order that they've been placed under their husbands. Now, think that, again, we have the, that word, like submit, that's like the dirtiest word you can possibly say, right? Especially in our culture. But look at the way our culture wants to flip this. The end of all things for our culture is that women would be the leaders and men would submit. So much so that men and women in our culture are physically trying to switch places. Not just in roles, but in the actual shape of their anatomy. Right? And so what he's saying here, what he's saying here is that as soon as Eve stepped out of place, even though they were already ordered in a way of uh, under the protection of their husbands, they would now continue to be in that place. They just wouldn't like it. That's not a that's not a condemnation of the order. That's a condemnation of the way we see the order. That we're upset about it. He says women will no longer want to submit to that order, and childbirth would what be painful. So how is it that 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 a reference to childbirth being painful now means that if women uh, have children, that they'll be saved through it. What he's saying is, as believers, we don't live according to the curse. See, the whole world is living according to the curse. Look at it. As a woman in our culture, what are you told? A, you don't submit to any man, ever. That's living according to the curse, that you don't like it, that you long for that power over your husband. So don't do that. And then the other thing that we're told is uh, having children will somehow end your life so our entire culture has now prized and put on a pedestal ending children's lives for their own convenience sake. So you see what I'm saying? He's referencing the entire curse and he's saying, you as believers, when you submit to your husbands and when you have children, you are living in opposition to the curse according to the order of God. You're actually fitting into the safety of the structure. You are being fruitful and multiplying. You're living according to the way God made it and intended it to work and be good. That's the whole point. This applies to, to uh, men too. We, men were told that um, they should that, that work would be hard. Well, what are men doing in our culture? They're taking it easy. They're sitting around. They're, they're forsaking responsibility. Men in our culture have given up. That's the nature of sin in men's life. We are supposed to live in opposition to the curse too. What does the Bible tell men to do? Work as though working unto the Lord. I'm supposed to do everything I do for the Lord. Paul right here is saying Christians don't live based on the consequences that came in the fall. They live in opposition to those consequences. When he says women will be saved through childbearing, He's encouraging the women to live according to what they know to be true, not because things will be hard, not because they want naturally in their sin nature something else, right? And he uses the phrase childbirth as a reference to the entire curse section in Genesis chapter 3. Because we have hope in Christ, we don't react to sin in sin. Because we have hope in Christ, we live according to the order that God set up before the fall, we serve a God of order. We continue in faith, in love, and in sanctity. We moderate ourselves instead of living in sinful excesses. We fit into the order, into the limits. You know, I, I, I've, I've always said, like, our culture thinks freedom is having no limits. Let me ask you this. If you're an alcoholic, where are you the most free? Inside a bar because you're free to go in there? No, because as soon as you go in that bar, you're enslaved to that substance. You know where you're free? When you set limits on yourself, where you block off the bar, where you can't go in there. Think about a fish. If a fish could go anywhere, would it be free everywhere? As soon as it got out of the water, would you see it flopping around, dying on dry land and go, that's the freest fish I have ever seen in my entire life? No. That fish is free when it's in the water and it's able to swim within limits and breathe. When we as believers live according to the limits God has set, according to the roles that he has given us, we're free. We finally find life and joy and peace and quiet and we can spread the gospel. It's when we live outside of those limits that we suffocate and die. 
that is the purpose of what Paul's saying here. This is not the patriarchy beating women over the head. This is this is Paul telling men and women how to live in true freedom, to find the place that God has established for them in the universal order and in the order of the church. Hey guys, this is Philip Jackson, pastor of Young Adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that's defined by real transformation and a sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.